Hi, my name is Eric Schmidt. I'm a developer advocate in the Google Cloud Platform team focused on data processing and analysis. In this video, I'm going to review core architectural concepts for performing streaming data processing. And then, I will use the Google Cloud Platform, specifically three managed services, Cloud PubSub, Cloud Dataflow, and BigQuery, to implement several near real-time streaming data processing patterns. This content is targeted at programmers and developers and architects interested in building cloud-based streaming processing systems. If you already have deep knowledge around modern streaming engines like Apache Spark, Apache Storm, or Apache Flink, some of this content may be redundant. However, if you're new to the cloud or have not looked at managed services on the Google Cloud platform, this video should prove useful to you. This video has three main sections. I will first introduce a sample scenario to help contextualize the concepts and business challenges related to streaming data processing. Then, I'll review a collection of architectural principles and demonstrate how to use managed services on the Google Cloud Platform to perform streaming processing and analysis. After watching this video, you should have a clear understanding on how to implement streaming data processing workflows with managed services on the Google Cloud Platform. This past spring, I was fortunate to work with Spotify's engineering team on their streaming data processing architecture while they were migrating to the Google Cloud Platform. Now in my spare time, I'm also a DJ at KXP 90.3 here in Seattle. And as such, I'm deeply passionate about music. The sample for this work was inspired by my work at KXP and my work with Spotify. I encourage you to go read Spotify's three-part blog post on their overall data processing architecture. You can find the series on the Spotify Labs blog or simply Google Spotify Event Delivery Architecture. My sample scenario is called Testify and is based on very simplified architecture. And the resulting analysis is quite narrow, mainly not to overshadow the main theme of this video, which is about understanding streaming processing. The sample is based on fabricated event log data from a mobile music application, to which I apply several fabricated questions. And these questions were inspired by some innovative work that Spotify is doing around BigQuery. Now, to be clear, this sample is about processing event data, not about streaming music. The logical model is as follows. I have a fake mobile device, and it emits events of different meaning and of different schema. These events are pushed to Ed servers hosting application services, and these services emit local event logs. These logs are then tailed in real time and ingested into a queue. And from there, I will apply some ETL processing and run some transforms to move that data into a durable store for further interactive analysis, dashboarding, and batch reporting. Now, the architectural concepts in this video can be applied to nearly any business challenge across any vertical, from fraud detection to advertising campaign analysis to inventory stockout alerting to real-time leaderboards. And the same architectural concepts apply regardless of vertical or workload. I picked the music event processing sample because it's fun, and well, at least for me, it's something that I really love. Now I'd like to review a collection of terms and tenets related to data processing. We will revisit the testify sample, but in the meantime, please keep some of the top level flow in mind. Now throughout this video, I will deliberately coalesce the concepts and physical manifestations of data processing and data analysis into the phrase data processing to simplify the messaging. However, they are different. Data processing is primarily about movement and transformation, aka ETL. For example, extracting log files and transforming them, filtering them, and then loading them to a, another location or durable store. Data analysis is primarily about applying computation or aggregations, things like count, sum, et cetera, over group collections. For example, performing statistical analysis over all data elements or sampled analysis. For example, counting the number of users that listen to a particular song by hour or by minute. Now, in the context of streaming analysis, it's also common to join streams with other streams and to join streams with at rest or batch data. I make this distinction up front as the architectural implications for processing and analysis are quite different. However, 
In practice, they're commonly blended into the same logical model, and in some cases, the same physical system. Now, no matter what business vertical you operate in, finance, healthcare, manufacturing, casual gaming, or the discipline in which you work, accounting, marketing, sales, customer service, the number one blocker for growth is a concept I like to call time to answer. Specifically, how fast can you get the answer to a question pertinent to your business at that time? In almost all cases, you're ultimately dependent upon data processing and analysis systems to answer these questions. Let's say you're, let's say you're an advertising analyst for a retail company. The time to answer a key question like, what is the conversion rate on my current marketing campaign, could mean the difference between driving ad, in ad inventory to the right customers or possibly wasting dollars on already stocked out products. If you're in the manufacturing space, focused on production line efficiency, knowing the answer to a question like, what is the current distribution of 2B process orders and how do those orders align to my existing machine setup? This could be the difference between positive and negative margins on your next production run. Or a question like, if you're a casual game developer, what percentage of users recently abandoned my game as a result of introducing new game logic? The time to answer here could have massive impact on your daily active users, or maybe you become the focus of the next episode of Silicon Valley. Now the theme across these questions is speed. I've never met a business or technical decision maker that said, I'd really like to have questions to my answers with more delay. The converse is true. It's the true state of business today now more than ever. Those who can answer questions faster are more likely to succeed and grow. The challenge is that growth creates more data and in turn creates more questions, thus more pressure on processing and analysis systems. And when implemented incorrectly, these underlying systems increase the time to answer. Time to answer matters. Now for decades, businesses have been using various techniques for data processing, batch being one of the most common patterns to answer questions like the ones I've previously raised. Now while effective, batch processing on fixed capacity, non-managed environments present risks related to cost control, increased time to answer, and answer accuracy or rather answer inaccuracy. Let's look at a simple example. Here we have a fixed data set, which will be processed via a batch job on a fixed cluster of resources. When these resources are ready and the job schedule time is hit to start, the job starts. The job and the resources are effectively blocked until the job is completed. After the job is completed, results are emitted. There is an effective clock time for this job. This is, in essence, the time to answer. For example, this job took 30 clock minutes to run and consumed a total of 200 minutes of resource time. Now we're going to extend the example. Let's add a new job. In this case, the new job will be blocked when the existing job is running. The typical response here is to add more resources, CPU, memory, disk, and network capacity and deploy the job to these new specific resources. Now, one of the challenge is that you end up potentially wasting resources. Notice that the previous job is now complete and the initial resources are now idle. Now that the second job is complete, our entire collection of resources is idle. If you have experience with Hadoop clusters, you might be thinking, well, this is what the resource manager and Yarn are for. And yes, they can be highly effective at optimizing resources based on scheduling semantics. However, the issue here is that if there are no jobs to be scheduled, the resources will remain idle. And in some cases, they just may be better to be torn down. The other challenge is that if you need to increase capacity on the cluster in an unmanaged environment, you're going to have to physically deploy and manage the life cycle of those resources. Let's take a look at the first job scenario again. Now at the time that the job was scheduled, the input data is effectively locked. In relational database terms, you can think about this as an effective page lock over the entire data set. However, in this case, some data arrives late after the job has started. And it was really supposed to be part of the original input set. Now the job finishes, output is created, but the output is now only partially correct 
or possibly completely inaccurate depending on the impact of the late data. There are many techniques to deal with this problem. Now if the job computation here is associative, one could rerun the job against the new data and add the results to the original job output, or one could delete the original results and rerun the entire job again. Now, each approach has its own challenges and risks. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that all batch processing is bad or that all unmanaged data processing is bad. I simply want to point out that there are inherent challenges for each approach, and depending on your use cases, data volumes, analysis requirements, and resource budget, you may encounter these issues. The next several concepts I'm going to talk about are grafted from two blog posts recently written by an amazing software engineer and also the technical lead for the Millwheel team here at Google. His name is Tyler Akido. I encourage you to go read them, Simply Google Streaming 101, and they show up at the top of the stack because they're highly relevant and they're highly popular. In the previous unmanaged batch section, I talked about late arriving data and its impact on the output of the batch job. Now, as I start to talk about streaming processing, I want to establish a distinction between the data, specifically its boundedness, and the processing approach. This concept is super helpful in understanding the valuable behaviors of a streaming system and how they might be able to be applied to your processing problems. So let's talk about boundedness. Bounded data is finite. It's at rest. It does not change. For example, you may have 10 terabytes of historical web log data, specifically in files in Avro format or JSON, sitting at rest in a blob store. Unbounded data is infinite. It's constantly changing. It's driven by frequency. It's driven by changes in size and potentially in schema. And the time associated with the data in the stream may be relevant to the event time or to its processing time. For example, you may be listening to a TCP socket and reading all the web log data coming from all of your servers. Processing, specifically in this case, bounded processing, Think of this as classic batch processing, specifically a processing engine applied to bounded data. And the same for unbounded. This is a specific mode of processing applied to an unbounded source. It's important to understand these definitions as their underlying implementations create specific architectural boundaries. In my previous batch example, the data was in fact unbounded. However, the system was treating it as bounded data. This is a very common pattern where one would run periodic batch jobs over unbounded data, say contained in a relational database like SQL Server or a NoSQL store like Mongo. It's a very valid approach, but it can lead to correctness issues or make a pattern, say like session analysis, very challenging. In addition to boundedness, the time domain associated with data can have a major impact on how data is processed and the correctness of the processing output. Event time is an explicit time associated with a data element or event tied to the clock time of when and where the event occurred. In most cases, the time is highly distributed and potentially volatile. Processing time is the time associated with the processing engine. In some cases, it might be the time the engine ingested the data. In others, it might be the time associated with the step or stage being executed within the engine. In most cases, this time is centralized or synchronized with a common time service. Let's use an example. I just played Justin Bieber on my Testify application at 1214 GMT on July 25th, 2016. That was the event time. However, this event was processed three minutes later by my streaming processing engine. Now the distinction between event time and processing time here is important because it will ultimately impact the correctness of my processing output. For example, if I was trying to count plays by minute, my results would be skewed by three minutes if I was using processing time. Now what I really wanted to know is I want to do count of plays by minute where time is relative to the actual play time, not processing time. Now the minimum delta between event time and processing time is relative to the speed of light, plus some additional lat latency, which we'll talk about next. Now, regardless of batch or streaming modes, 
If you're dealing with unbounded data and you want to process data based on event time, you need to understand your latency exposure and then employ techniques to deal with late arriving data. In a perfect world, latency would be zero. Well, it would at least be abounded by the speed of light. Or it'd be nice if you could understand and have some type of fixed overall system latency. But we don't live in a perfect world. In my testify example, there are three areas that could create latency. On the transmission side from my phone to the cloud, it could be something as simple as network unavailability. Or it could be something very downstream, like a slow disk that is backing a queue, and those reads are now reduced on the throughput side, which would create latency. In almost all cases, you don't have control over these potential issues, but the best thing you can do is plan for what level of latency you could expect and that you're willing to tolerate and have a plan with how you deal with late arriving data. I'll talk more about how you deal with late arriving data in the next section. Now that we understand event versus processing time and the impact of latency, we need an additional primitive to rationalize time into manageable groups. Having the ability to window data into finite chunks enables computation that would otherwise be impossible. For example, without windowing, it'd be very difficult to perform even a simple aggregation like count or sum over unbounded data. In essence, you need a mechanism to group all events into a window in order to apply an aggregation to a window that has some level of data completeness. In classic MapReduce, you'd create keys that were tied to start and ends of windows. In other systems, say like Apache Storm, you could set the timestamp for a tuple, and then that timestamp is propagated into a window. Now, not all processing systems support all window types. I will talk a little bit later about specific windowing support in different processing engines. Well, before I stop talking about time, I need to cover another important concept that is, tightly bound, that is tightly bound to latency, which is the concept of a watermark. Here you can see event time on the x-axis and processing time on the y-axis. In a perfect zero latency world, we could use an ideal watermark that moves linearly tied to clock time. But the world is not fair, and latency is everywhere. Thus, if we're going to perform processing based on event time, we need a heuristic-driven watermark. Now, this watermark is an estimate based on various techniques. For example, a simple distribution sampler, or something more sophisticated, like looking at the oldest unprocessed message in an upstream queue. Now, if the heuristic is too slow, results are delayed. If the heuristic is too fast, results may be marked late. Now, in this example, I'm doing some fixed window analysis. Notice that in the event time window of 1201 to 1202, there is an event of value nine, but it's been marked as red because it was processed way past the watermark. It was marked late. The question is, what do you do with late data? I'm gonna talk a little bit more later about how to deal with late data, as well as how to trigger speculative results within a window. We can now tie all these concepts together and end on a crisp definition of streaming. Streaming is an execution engine, system, service, runner, capable of processing unbounded data. And when designed correctly, a streaming processing engine can provide low latency, speculative or partial results, the ability to flexibly reason about time, provide controls for correctness, and ultimately the power to perform complex analysis. Now that I have the basic terms and tenets laid out for streaming processing, I'm gonna use several managed services on the Google Cloud Platform to build a streaming data processing application. Specifically, I'm gonna use Cloud PubSub for ingestion, Cloud Dataflow for processing and imperative analysis, and BigQuery for durable storage and interactive analysis. Cloud PubSub is a managed service for streaming data on the Google Cloud Platform. Cloud PubSub enables durable asynchronous messaging applications, including patterns for one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many. Cloud PubSub is globally available 
with large message size support up to 10 megabytes per put. And Cloud PubSub provides at least once delivery with low latency and on-demand scalability to 1 million messages per second and beyond. Now, PubSub is technically a streaming engine as it can process unbounded data. However, it does not provide mechanisms for reasoning about time or the ability to express computation over the stream. We will use other services to perform processing and analysis. As you can see, PubSub is a hub to enable streams to flow in and out of GCP services. Moreover, it can be connected to any service on the cloud or on-premise via HTTP or directly over sockets via gRPC. PubSub uses a simple topic subscription model to enable fan-in and fan-out messaging topologies. In my testify example, I may route all events to a single topic, or I could split event types across topics and then multiplex them to multiple subscribers. Here is a zoomed view of my testify demo application. I'm going to show you how to set up a cloud PubSub topic to ingest an unbounded stream, which will then be processed by Cloud Dataflow. In this case, I'll be using one topic to ingest a stream of events being generated by a data fabricator, which mimics log creation. There are several ways to interact with Cloud PubSub. You can use the REST API, one of the Google Cloud Client Language Libraries, or for basic management operations, you can use the Google Cloud Console. You can see that I have two existing topics in my Google Cloud Console. I'll create a new topic called Testify Demo. Now, once I hit Create, this topic is globally available to receive messages at a default rate up to 100 megabytes per second with a maximum message size of 10 megabytes. If you need additional quota, please follow the instructions in the quota section of the Cloud PubSub documentation. Now you'll notice that there's no forced sharding or bucketing when you set up your topic. Simply give it a name, call create, and then start publishing data. Now let's look at something a little bit more interesting. I previously created a topic called Testify Events. This is receiving my fabricated event data. Now this topic has two active subscriptions. These were created by my Cloud Dataflow job reading the event stream. Now let's look at this topic in my management console called Stackdriver. Stackdriver is a real-time monitoring, logging, and diagnostic service for Google Cloud, AWS, and open source packages. Here I created a dashboard for my PubSub resources showing four graphs. My publish rate, my pull rate, the number of undelivered messages, and the oldest unacknowledged message time. You can create your own graphs based on event rate, event size, errors, and many other dimensions. I built these graphs in order to monitor the overall lag in my event processing system. Now, I'm publishing right now at approximately 101 to 100,000 events per second, and I'm reading or pulling them at roughly the same rate. And my undelivered message count is right around between 150 and 200,000 messages. Cloud PubSub has a built-in seven-day retention policy for undelivered messages. If I were to say shut down my downstream reader, in this case Cloud Dataflow, all the messages would be durably stored for seven days. Now one last highlight that is helpful for Cloud PubSub workflow as many other workflows like complete storage, etc., is the ability to create custom alerting policies which can monitor specific metrics and thresholds and then send you notifications. Here, I had created a policy to check a particular metric. In this case, I wanted to look at messages published for my testify events topic if it was above a threshold of 50,000 events per second for greater than one minute. And in this case, it would alert the dashboard as well as send me an email. Now that you understand the basics of Cloud PubSub, and we've set up a topic and showed you some management techniques, and we have a live topic and subscription running, let's look at how Cloud Dataflow is processing the stream. Google Cloud Dataflow is a managed data processing service 
and an open source programming model that unifies batch and streaming processing into one model. The Cloud Dataflow service provides on-demand resource deployment and management on a per-job basis. This means you can scale your data processing without resource contention and limits found in fixed clusters. The service automatically scales resources up and down for both batch and streaming jobs, freeing you from under or over provisioning resources and enabling you to optimize your time to answer. The Cloud Dataflow programming model was the basis for the now open source Apache Software Foundation incubator project called Apache Beam. Functionally, Cloud Dataflow unifies batch and streaming into one model. It enables processing in processing time space as well as event time space. It provides windowing primitives with support for fixed sliding and session windows that support advanced triggering mechanisms for speculative window emission and to deal with late arriving data. The Cloud Dataflow managed service is geared at driving a no ops or no operations deployment and management model. Instead of you spending time downloading packages, spinning up compute resources, tuning cluster configuration, and dealing with control plane issues, you simply code your pipeline and submit your pipeline as a job to the service, and it handles the rest. You're only charged for the time that your job executes on the service. Since resources are deployed and managed completely on demand, you can reduce the capital cost of deploying and managing long-running fixed capacity clusters. The service can seamlessly transition between batch and streaming processing, providing a single service to handle bounded and unbounded data processing. Now, with forthcoming Apache Beam support, you will be able to migrate your data flow jobs across Apache Spark, Apache Flink, and other runners. Here is a logical view of a simple cloud data flow pipeline for my testify workflow. You submit the pipeline as a job and the service will then deploy the worker resources and schedule the work. In this case, I start with a bounded source. I read the log data, apply some simple transformations and then write it to various shards. Now, let's migrate this to an unbounded source and turn this into a streaming process. Nothing changes with the pipeline other than changing the source. Finally, let's add some windowing and add a simple aggregator, in this case, account. I could continue to add more and more branches to the pipeline. I could split the graph. I could apply varying windows and even apply more sophisticated aggregations. This is a view of my running cloud data flow streaming job, which is processing the events published into my pub sub topic and flowing to related subscriptions. It has been running for a little over two hours and 40 minutes, and it has processed around 971 million events. The graph starts by reading event data from PubSub. This event data is text CSV formatted. You could also process JSON, Avro, XML, or create your own custom format. Now, of important note, I'm using event time as my time domain, not processing time. To do this, I tell Dataflow to look for a specific label on each PubSub message called timestamp. From there, Dataflow handles the calculation of the data watermark, which, as the watermark advances, any window ending before or at that time will be closed. I'm using event time here in order to provide a higher level of accuracy for my aggregations. If I were to use processing time, I never could be guaranteed to have all the data relevant to a specific event time window. After reading the raw stream data, data is sent to parse transform. This transform has two steps, parse and deserialize. Deserialize maps the parse CSV data into an object called event. From here, the job has three main goals. Goal number one is focused on archiving and is mainly a load function in terms of a typical ETL job. Specifically, I want to do some basic formatting on every event and write each event to a durable store for additional processing or analysis. In this case, my durable store is BigQuery. Note, this data is assigned to the job's global window and does not wait for any specific window to close. In essence, it is processed as fast as possible 
In this case, it's written to BigQuery via its streaming API. The latency for this data is a function of transmit time, plus PubSub time, plus data flow time, plus availability time in the downstream store. Now, since I'm not using windowing, this latency calculation may not be very helpful if you're trying to determine data completeness. More specifically, if you're trying to perform analysis over the raw events, in this case in BigQuery, your analysis may be partially inaccurate if you are addressing event times within the latency window. There are specific techniques to deal with late arriving data, as well as emitting early results, which I will address next. Goal number two is to calculate the total number of plays per track per 10 minute fixed window. And I want to update the output every 15 seconds. View this output like a meter. As time progresses, the metric should increase as long as events arrive for that particular track key. Since I have a fixed window, I can enforce the duration for how long I want to tolerate late data. In this case, since I'm doing some dashboarding, my threshold is small, only 15 seconds. Any late data ar arriving outside of the 10 minute window plus 15 seconds will be ignored. Now each key, specifically a track ID, will have up to 40 updates, updating 15 seconds processing time over a 10 minute window. In the Testify use case, there are hundreds of thousands of tracks. To deal with this volume of highly mutating data, I am using Cloud Bigtable as the durable store. The latency for this metric will be transmit time plus pub sub time plus 15 seconds plus any additional lag in closing the window plus big table write time. Now writes to big table happen in milliseconds, which greatly reduces the overall latency from the metric value. Goal number three is more of a data warehousing pattern. Its purpose is to drive a rollup aggregation. I want to calculate the total number of plays per track per 15 minute window. And in this case, I also want to address any late arriving data up to five minutes after the window closes. The latency here is transmit time plus pub sub time plus 15 minutes plus any additional lag in closing the window plus write time. Now there's also the possibility that data could arrive late up to five minutes after the window closes. And since I'm using discarding windows, the new window will only contain the late arriving data. For downstream consumers, they can now be guaranteed with high confidence that this aggregation is a complete view of the event stream for that time period. And if they see late arriving data, they can choose how to handle it. Now that you have a better idea of the processing goals for this pipeline and the power of Dataflow's streaming processing model, we'll look at what and how you can perform additional analysis over the stream and its aggregations using BigQuery and Bigtable. BigQuery is a fully managed data warehouse that provides fast, scalable, interactive analysis through familiar SQL syntax. Queries can address a few bytes up to petabytes in scale and also supports real-time ingestion of data streams. BigQuery can ingest up to 100,000 rows per second per table. and You can get additional throughput with simple table sharding. This data is available in seconds, meaning a query that is addressing at-rest data can also address data that was recently ingested into an unbounded table. The sources from this data can come from places like PubSub, Dataflow, now, BigQuery is technically a streaming engine since it can deal with unbounded data. However, it does not have the ability to rationalize time space. And specifically, it does not understand late arriving data and does not provide a triggering mechanism to handle late data. This is the role of an upstream streaming engine like Cloud Dataflow. Now, if you have a steady handle on end-to-end -end system latency, directly bypassing computation in Dataflow may be a valid option. At the same time, if you're using Dataflow to stream data into BigQuery, it also makes a lot of sense to potentially pre-aggregate data. For example, performing group buys and simple aggregations that can then be used for common queries. As you will see in my demo, using BigQuery is super simple. You don't have to worry about indexing or resharding or storage resizing or adding server capacity. You simply load or stream your data 
into BigQuery and then execute a query. This is the power of managed services on the Google Cloud platform. This is the BigQuery console in my Google Cloud project. I have an existing data set for my streaming workflow called Testify. This data set contains raw events streaming from my data flow pipeline, as well as other data, like track count by window, and related data, like artists, releases, and labels. Let's take a look at the event table. The event table schema is fairly straightforward. It has columns like event ID, event time, user ID, track ID, and create time. The table itself is just a little over four and a half terabytes in size. Now, with this raw event data, I can create some very big and interesting queries, especially if I join that raw event data to other data. Here I want to calculate the top artists by stream count. To do that, I need to join my raw events to track information and track information to release credit in order to resolve the artist name. And then I'll do a group by in order to get the track count. Now, it should take between 20 and 30 seconds for this query to run. There you go, 26 and then a half seconds processing just under a half a terabyte of data. And sadly, Justin Bieber is the top artist by total streams. Now the power here is that I didn't have to worry about sharding or indexes. I simply wrote my query and executed it. And having access to my real-time information could be very valuable depending on my data completeness needs. Now, let's take a look at the output from the rollup aggregation driven by my data flow job. If you recall, this was a count of tracks uh, by track ID by a 15 minute window and that transform also handled late arriving data. So I'm gonna go back and grab the ID, track ID from Justin Bieber and add that as part of my where clause and run this query. So I'm gonna filter on Justin Bieber to see what his track counts look like over time. Now, since this is a roll up, the query ran much faster, around 1.7 seconds. And you can see that the track count metric is calculated by window, that 15 minute window. And if data arrived late, the window, specifically the timing, would have been marked as late. You can also see that the latency between the end of the window and the write time is roughly around 30 seconds. So the total latency would be the 15 minutes of the window plus the latency of the write time, or around 15 minutes and 30 seconds. This is highly accurate analysis against the real time stream. Now this is great, but let's explore even lower latency output from our dashboarding transform. The output from that transform is written to Cloud Bigtable. Cloud Bigtable is Google's NoSQL big database service. It's managed and is designed to handle massive loads with consistent low latency and high throughput. It's an excellent solution for highly mutating data over large key ranges. Here's my current Testify cluster. And as configured, can handle reads and writes at 30,000 QPS with a consistent latency of six milliseconds. Now, the dashboarding transform from my data flow pipeline emits accumulating updates every 15 seconds for a given track and window key. Let's go back to the data flow console and look at the current data watermark for my cloud big table IO step. So right now, the data watermark is at 21 41. I'm basically in the 40th minute segment in the 2100 hour. Now, using my HBase client, I'm going to call a git on tracks tied to the track key for Justin Bieber. And I'm going to look at the fourth hour and 40th minute window. And there's the value right now. Uh, he's had 25,147 streams in that window. Now, depending where I'm at in that 15 second cycle, we should see that increase. Probably caught it right on the end there. There you go. So now it's at 27,302. 
And this will continue to uh, accumulate um, all the way up to the four hour and uh, 50 minute window. And then we'll cycle a new key and the accumulator will start over. So this is fantastic. I have thousands and thousands of keys and I can continue to mutate them, the values over these windows. Now the access time here is a bit inflated. So it's roughly about 0.38 seconds, mainly because I'm querying from my laptop into the cloud. If I was doing this on the cloud, I'd be seeing response times in six, 10, you know, ish millisecond range. The point here is that this track count is dead accurate within 15 seconds of the live stream. Now let's pull this all together. I built a dashboard in Data Studio 360. Google Data Studio 360 turns your data into beautiful informative reports that are easy to read and easy to share. It seamlessly integrates with BigQuery, Cloud SQL, MySQL, Google Analytics, AdWords, and many other data sources. I chose it because it's easy to use, but you could easily apply these same processing techniques to drive homegrown reports or integrate the data into maybe some existing Tableau deployments. Once you have your windowing and correctness techniques dialed in, the possibilities are endless for highly accurate, low latency streaming data processing and analysis. Now, as I start to wrap up, I wanna leave you with some general guidance. To start with, ingest everything into BigQuery. Now, there are some exceptions. If you have very fast changing data, Cloud Bigtable may be a better fit for you. Cloud Bigtable is our managed HBase implementation. It's good, say, if you're building a real-time leaderboard and you need to constantly update the same key space. Bigtable is a much better fit. Another thing to consider is decide if you really need to do event time processing and what cases do you need to cover that require event time processing. Event time processing is more resource intensive to use, so use it wisely. I strongly suggest that you use Google Cloud Dataflow to produce aggregations that are going to be commonly used for queries in another system, say like BigQuery. This will ultimately reduce the time and resource costs related to those queries. Here are some general guidance for Dataflow as you get started. Now the first one challenges everything that I've said about streaming. Keep in mind that streaming isn't a solution to all problems. For example, a, performing a bulk database snapshot migration is much better suited for a batch job. And specifically, you could run that batch job with Cloud Dataflow. Now, the main decision point about using batch or streaming will be around the boundedness and your ability to deal with latency and data correctness. In either case of batch or streaming, Utilize auto-scaling to remove the guesswork from resource capacity planning. If you are going to use Windows, specifically session windows, use them carefully. They are very powerful, but they're also very resource intensive. In a lot of cases, you may be able to use fixed windows over session windows. This next one may be obvious, but the guidance is to prune output from your transforms inside of your pipeline as much as possible. This helps reduce network transmission and serialization overhead. If you are using Dataflow in streaming mode with PubSub, I encourage you to use additional subscriptions in order to do backfill or emergency replay. And finally, I encourage you to use custom transforms as much as possible. This will help with composability as you build more and new pipelines. For BigQuery, I have the following guidance. I already said this, but I'll say it again. Ingest everything into BigQuery. It's cost effective, especially when addressing historical data. At a penny per gig, it is an excellent alternative to standard blob storage. Plus, you have access to it via a query or via Cloud Dataflow. Next guidance is select only the columns that you need. Again, sounds obvious, but I've seen query after query that wastefully addresses data that is never used. Next, Consider restricting access to raw event tables, especially if you're following this guidance around streaming and streaming everything into BigQuery. And you restrict access to a few folks 
whose job it is to write queries to answer business questions. Now, unfettered access to all data is great, uh, but it comes with some risks, both security concerns as well as cost control. Fortunately, BigQuery has a very flexible model to control table access. And finally, if you need more processing power, simply request more slots. We're here to serve. Streaming data processing, when implemented correctly, can reduce the time to answer and increase accuracy of analysis. Event time processing is a critical architectural need when attempting to rationalize data completeness. Now, some streaming engines are more robust than others, and this is a good thing. It all comes down to the ability to couple these systems together and make sure that they work better together. Managed services remove the element of human interaction and human costs, specifically deploying and babysitting infrastructure. Data processing analysis is about writing amazing pipelines and queries to solve business problems, not deploying and managing servers. Now, I only touched on Cloud PubSub, Cloud Dataflow, and BigQuery really to drill home the point about the power of managed services and streaming engine composability. But there is so much additional power on the Google Cloud Platform for data processing. If you want to bring your existing Hadoop workloads to the cloud, great. We have amazing managed support for Hadoop via Cloud Data Proc. If you want ultra low latency, high throughput, durable storage for changing key data, Cloud Bigtable is an excellent managed alternative to standalone HBase. If you want highly available, globally addressable NoSQL, Data Store is an excellent solution. If you want managed MySQL, try out Cloud SQL. Now, beyond being a platform leader for streaming processing, the Google Cloud Platform is an amazing place for any scale of data processing and analysis. I will leave you with the simplest of advice. If you have not already, I encourage you to go and read the docs for Cloud PubSub, Dataflow, and BigQuery. Understand the value and feature set of each product. Then, specifically, go build out the Cloud Dataflow mobile gaming example. It's a solid implementation of the feature set, grounded in real-world use cases. Then, write your own pipeline, but keep it simple. Answer one question end to end, and then build from there. Finally, have fun. Thank you.